Hello everyone and welcome to Eat to Treat. Um, we are a nonprofit whose goal is to end health disparities and I'm Dr. Maris Williams. I have a PhD in nutrition, I'm an avid foodie, and I love to cook. So I do these cook-along cooking demonstrations um, every month, every first and third Saturday of every month and uh, we make hypertension and diabetes friendly recipes that um, are usually low in salt or almost always low in salt and uh, high in fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains if we have them. Today we're not doing whole grains, but um, whole grains and it's just generally a well-balanced meal. So um, I put the ingredients on eat-to-treat.org ahead of time and so that you can join me while we cook and uh, make um, and make a, a great meal ahead of time. Hello. Uh, so um, today we're making spaghetti squash which is something that people don't eat that much but it's um, delicious and easy to make so I'm gonna show you how to make it today. So let's get started. I'm gonna change the camera view. Okay, so if you don't know, this is a spaghetti squash. This one's a little beat up, but it's a yellow football, basically. Um, a lot of people on a lot of recipes on the internet tell you to cut it in half lengthwise, like this, and put it um, cut side down on a baking sheet and bake it. And that's a perfectly acceptable way to. Um, cook spaghetti squash but uh, a chef told me uh, chef Mike he said that if you cut the ends off then you don't have to worry about cutting through the thick stem so I'm just gonna cut the ends off and then I'll have a flat surface to stand it up and then cut it in half once it's standing up standing up um, then easy and it's very tough so you need a sharp knife but the easiest way to cut it in half is to get your knife started and then rock the knife back and forth like this and I'm shaking my table so if this picture is shaking sorry and then you can get through it so again you just get your knife started and I do that by sliding the knife in the squash and then rock the knife until you get through the squash okay and so now I've cut the tough parts off the stem and the little um, not sure what to call that but um, so now I have a, a flat surface I can stand up my squash and I can um, go ahead and cut it in half lengthwise and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to rock my knife as much as I can. Ugh, goodness. Yeah, it's it's work. So, um, but if you can cut a watermelon, you can cut a spaghetti squash. A little bit stuck here. There we go. Okay. I'm going to get the knife back in there. <laughs> Very carefully get through the squash. Okay. So, this is what the inside looks like. It's just a bunch of seeds and uh, strings. So, what you do is you take your spoon, a, a one with a good heavy handle that's not going to bend on you and just scrape out the seeds and the membranes on the inside so um i've seen people do it where they don't have to use their hands and get their hands all slimy but um i haven't mastered that technique so i just Use my thumb and pull the pull the seeds out with the membranes that I loosen with the spoon. 
And you don't have to get it super clean in there. Just you want to make sure you get all the seeds, though, because when you um, when it's cooked and you get the spaghetti part of the squash out, if there's seeds in there, you're going to have seeds on your plate. And they're not it's not like the good, crunchy, roasted pumpkin seeds that you can get. It's going to be uh, kind of wet seeds that are not crunchy. So definitely you want to get the seeds out. And um, most recipes on the internet will tell you to put olive oil or whatever oil you're using and salt and pepper once you get the seeds out and then put it face down on a baking sheet. But I find that that does not impart any real flavor on the spaghetti squash and it's not necessary the oil is not necessary it doesn't help it from sticking or anything so i'm gonna skip that step but if you want to do that i guess go for it uh cooking is not there's no real rules you just do what you want to do basically and going i'm almost done so now we got the seeds out and i'm going to as alluded to put it face down on a baking she sheet now because i cut the ends off the steam that's produced in the oven is going to escape um if I didn't cut the ends off, the steam would kind of build up on the inside of the squash. And so um, a lot of recipes on the internet, they will tell you to poke holes in the squash. But because we cut the ends off, that's not really necessary. Um, and to keep it from drying out too much, I'm actually going to put some water in the baking pan. This is how, again, this is how Chef Mike does his squash. So I put some water in the baking pan, just enough to cover the, the surface the, of, the, of the pan. And then I'm gonna put it in a 425 degree oven. So uh, if you have not um, turned your oven on, go ahead and turn it on to 425. And then when it's preheated, put your squash in there. But right now I'm gonna put this in the oven. Okay, and you want to bake your squash for 42 minutes, 40 minutes to an hour. I did, um, it depends on the size of your squash, obviously. But when it starts to brown on the outside, that's how you know that it's done on the inside. So, um, so bake it until it starts to brown on the outside, keeping in mind that the side that's away from the oven door is going to brown first. So you got to have a good view of it to, to see when it starts to brown. Otherwise, it'll get very brown. And don't ask me how I know that. Um, all right. Next up is we're going to make the mushroom sauce, which has chicken in it. That's op optional. Um, and I think I'm going to do the onion first. I've got a a peeled tearless onion and the tearless just means that when you cut it you're not gonna cry so if you came here to see that sorry to disappoint you um, I'm just gonna cut the stem off I'm gonna keep the root end attached this is the root end I'm gonna keep that attached um, because that's what holds the onion together and cut it in half through the root end so I got it stuck together on both halves and then I'm just going to slice mine, but if you want small pieces of onion, um, you can dice it. I mean, again, it's, it's whatever you think is going to be delicious. I think because we got long strands of spaghetti squash, we can have long strands of onion too. So, um... Okay, the question is, that size squash is 
more something. Let's see. More tender to cut and cook. Oh, that size of squash is the most tender to cut and cook. Yeah, that's the I I try to get the smaller squash because they of course they charge you by the weight of the squash, and um, it's just a lot. So, and I it's just me, so I'm not feeding a whole family. But if you are, then you can get a bigger squash and obviously enjoy with your family. All right, so. Looks like my onion is starting to grow. It's got green on the in inside. That's perfectly fine. It's not bad. Just means that it was sitting on my counter a little longer than some of my other onions. Okay. I'm putting the onions in a bowl. Normally when I cut something, I almost always put it directly in the pan because I'm um, cooking and cutting at the same time, but the reason why I'm doing that this time is because we're going to cook the chicken first and I'm going to cut the chicken last. So I'm going to cut everything and then start cooking. So next up is the mushrooms. Um, I forgot to rinse these mushrooms off. Um, FYI, mushrooms grow in peat moss, not like on something that's unsanitary so it's it's okay to eat them without rinsing them but as you can see they do have a plenty of uh, peat moss on them I don't think I want to eat all the peat moss so I'm just going to wipe it off of my cutting board that up all right so now I'm just gonna um, cut the mushrooms into quarters and have sizable chunks of mushroom because that's how I like mine but if you want it sliced um, feel free to go ahead and slice them what I would suggest if you are slicing them is to cut it in half first and then slice it like this because then you have a flat surface on your uh, cutting board and it's not going to roll around on you and you don't have to fight it. The mushrooms will, will run from you if you give them a chance. So, um, it's good to get a flat surface. So I have a pound of mushrooms here. Um, these are Baby Bella or Crimini mushrooms. And these are my favorite type of mushroom, but you can use whatever you want. When I was testing this recipe, I made it with uh, some half crimini and half um, shiitake mushrooms. I think doing that, the shiitake flavor was a little strong for me. If you really like shiitake mushrooms, then go for it. But I thought the shiitake flavor was a little too strong. So I'm just going to do straight crimini this time and we're going to see how it turns out. Now, if you don't like mushrooms, this sauce recipe is basically a velouté sauce. And um, velouté sauce is just basically a good quality stock with a roux. And a roux is just um, flour and fat. We're using olive oil. And the flour and the fat together make a thickener. And so we're basically making a thickened chicken stock um, Thickened chicken stock sauce. And that um, can be customized. So we're using thickened chicken stock with chicken in it and then mushrooms. But if you don't like mushrooms, you can do whatever you want. Um, this would be good with carrots and onions and um, celery, the classic 
combination that they refer to as mirepoix. This would also be good with herbs. And you can even add herbs to the, this mushroom variety if you want. Um, and then, you know, whatever flavor you want. Sun-dried tomatoes would be good in this. Uh, any vegetable that is flavorful, like asparagus, um, also would be really good in this. So... Take out the mushrooms, put whatever you want, but I like mushrooms, so that's why I made a mushroom sauce. And then you can top it, use it to top your spaghetti squash. And have a, a delicious meal. Alright, almost done with these mushrooms. And then the next step is we're going to cut up some jalapeno. Uh... The one jalapeno is not enough to make it spicy. If you want it spicy, I would suggest adding a habanero. I have a question. Yeah, sun-dried tomatoes are one of my favorite ingredients. I always have those on hand. Um, the They come in a jar packed in oil, but they also come dried in like a little package. And the, both, I, I keep the jar and the oil in the fridge and it lasts for a long time, especially if the oil is high enough that it covers the tomatoes and they're not exposed. Um, but the the package of dried tomatoes without the oil lasts a little longer. So uh, that's what I like to, to keep on hand. All right, I got a giant jalapeno here. I'm just going to cut the stem off. I'm going to cut it in half lengthwise. And then cut each of these halves in quarters probably not quarters but thirds um because it's it's quite large but generally when i cut a jalapeno i cut it into half and then cut it in half again make quarters and then i'm just gonna slice the jalapeno and i'm not making this super tiny because like i said jalapenos are not that spicy but they do have a good flavor, which is why we're including them. All right, so you've noticed that I've put the mushrooms, the onions, and the jalapenos all in the same bowl, and that's because they're going in the pan at the same time. What is not going in the pan at the same time is the kale. Kale goes in last, so it doesn't get mushy and gross. Now, I recommend in this recipe dinosaur kale, but that's not what I have here. What I have here is regular pearly leaf kale. And that is because I went to two grocery stores and none of them had dinosaur kale. I was very dismayed. Um, so I'm just going to cut off the thick hard stems on the curly leaf kale. And then just roughly chop it. It's not um, doesn't have to be exact because no one's gonna know if it's not all the same size. So I'm just gonna um, cut through the whole bunch until we get to the stems. Maybe one more time. And then get rid of the stems. And now I've got my kale chopped. You can go leaf by leaf if you want, but it'll take a long time. So, all right. We've got all the veggies cut, which means we can now cut the chicken without having to worry about cross-contamination. And for the chicken, I did remember to rinse my chicken. Um, I've got... Three chicken thighs, which is about a pound of chicken, which is um, plenty enough for a serving of, to make a serving of four, for four people. So everyone gets a quarter pound of chicken and plenty of veggies. And I'm just going to slice my chicken one way and then slice it the other way so that I have chunks.
You can do one at a time, but I'm just doing all three at the same time. All right. Now I'm just going to take my slices and turn them and slice them again so that I have chunks. And you can start heating your pan now. Heat some olive oil in it, and we'll just put the chicken directly in there. Um, I might salt my chicken a little bit while it's cooking. All we're doing is browning it now. Um, and then we're going to take it out of the pan and then cook the vegetables and then put it back in the pan. The only reason why we're taking it out of the pan to cook the vegetables is because the vegetables take up a lot of space. So once we get the vegetables cooked down and there's room for the chicken, we can put the chicken back in. Which means we don't need to cook the chicken all the way till it's done because it's going to cook more. We're just going to brown it, take it out, put it in a bowl, cook the vegetables, put it back in the chicken, and put the chicken back in the pan to cook it completely. Okay, so like I said, turn on your pan. I'm doing... Six out of ten. I want it up high so that it browns the chicken. I'll put about a tablespoon of olive oil in there. And put the chicken in. Okay, and then um, I'm going to put a little bit of salt in. And the reason why I'm putting salt in is because I'm not using low sodium chicken broth. I'm using no salt added chicken broth, which has very little sodium in it. If you're using low sodium, then um, it has more salt in it than this stuff, which is no salt added. So I'm going to salt my chicken a little bit. And that's good. And then go ahead and let it cook. So now we just wait for the chicken to cook. I'm going to turn it up a little bit higher. I'm at 7 out of 10 right now. And it's already starting to cook a little bit on the outside. Your spaghetti squash, um, I'm going to show you how to remove it from the shell, I guess. It's not really a shell, but I'm not sure what you would call it. The outside of the squash. And clean up a little bit. Okay, so this is what I meant when I said if you leave it in there, it um, browns a little bit extra, and then it'll continue to cook after you take it out. So, um, but this is a freshly cooked spaghetti squash. That's what it looks like when it's cooked. Um, yes, we're trying to brown the chicken, so you don't have to stir it that much. Just stir it occasionally, and it will brown. And that's why I have it on high heat, is so that it will brown. Uh, okay, so spaghetti squash. 
All you do for the spaghetti squash is use your fingers or a spoon or a fork and just pull the strands away from the edges of the um, of the squash, the shell part. And you can see that you get strands of squash. And that is why they call it spaghetti squash. It is not a misnomer. It is for real spaghetti squash. Um, and I'm just going to get my plate here. Uh, run out of space. Okay. Get my plate and put some on my plate so that I'm ready when my hmm, this is still a little bit hot. So that I'm ready when my um, sauce is done. And I think that's plenty. So I'll set that to the side. Alright, and the chicken is getting there. I will say the chicken is throwing a little bit of a wrench in my plans here. I made this before um, without the chicken in it, but due to popular requests, I decided to put chicken in it. Uh, it's good if you if you don't want chicken, you can do it all a vegan way to do it, which is um, using vegetable stock instead of chicken stock and omitting the chicken and then it, it'll actually be vegan um, so I think the chicken is browned so I'm going to take it off and I have a bowl for it back on high I'm at six and a half out of uh, ten and I'm gonna put some more olive oil in my pan and then throw the veggies in there Turn it up to seven. Seven out of ten. And I probably need a little bit more oil because the mushrooms do soak up oil. So I'm going to add some more oil. A bigger pan. Okay.
All right, so spoiler alert. What we're gonna do is cook down the veggies and then um, add the flour. And when once the veggies have cooked down a bit, we're gonna make sure there's plenty of oil still in the pan and that's gonna be our fat. And then the flour is gonna mix with the flat fat when, you, when we add it to make our roux. And the roux, like I said, is a thickener. And then once the fat and the flour have been mixed together well enough, we will put the stock in. And the stock will be thickened by the roux, obviously. And that is the plan. Um, so like I said, I'm using no salt added, added stock. And I am going to use about two cups of it to my two tablespoons of flour. But depending on the humidity and how old your flour is and how much oil you have and a whole bunch of other factors, the amount of um, the amount of, of liquid you need to balance out the thickness and to have the right consistency varies. So I'm gonna start with two cups, but I can add more and I probably will be adding more to make the consistency right. vegetables are cooking down nicely. And this recipe is really almost done. I mean, we can um, start to clean up a little bit in between stirring the sauce So, in the interest of time, I've got my flour ready. When do you add the kale? The kale is after we add the stock. So we don't want the kale to get too wilted and um, mushy and unpleasant. Uh, so we are adding it after we add the stock and the stock has thickened a bit. We're going to put the kale in there and cook the kale in the hot thickened stock. Okay. All right, so my onions are starting to get a little translucent and a little softened. Which is what we're going for. Oops. And I mean that that's a good question about the kale. So if you are adapting this recipe, say you don't like mushrooms and you're using some other vegetable, put the vegetable in however many minutes before the sauce will be done that 
that vegetable needs to cook. So if you were doing asparagus and the asparagus spears are really thin, then I would put the um, asparagus in after the stock as well. But if you got big old meaty, thick asparagus um, sticks, then you might saute them with the onion and the jalapeno. You know what I mean? So it, it just depends on how long the vegetable needs to cook that, that you are um, adding to this to the sauce. Okay, so I think I think we're good on the veggies. So I'm gonna add the chicken and its juices back in. And that is going to give me plenty of fat and uh, liquid to absorb my flour when I add my flour to thicken the sauce. Alright, so I'm letting that come up to temperature a little bit and then I'm going to add my approximately two tablespoons of flour. This doesn't have to be exact because like I said we're going to balance out the thickening part of the flour with the stock. So if you have a little bit more, a little bit less flour, then you're going to have a little bit more, a little bit less chicken stock. And it's all going to be balanced out. So this is not a recipe that you have to do exactly. This is just um, kind of like a rule of thumb type of thing. So I'm going to stir the flour in with all the fat and the vegetables so that it cooks a little bit. Because raw flour um, is not as appetizing as cooked flour. So we want to cook it in with the oil. And the oil will stop it from clumping when we add the chicken stock. Because nobody wants flour clumps in their sauce. Alright. So I think my flour is pretty well incorporated. So I'm ready to add my stock. Okay. So I already measured out my stock. I got two cups of stock here. And I think I'm going to start. And by the way, my, my heat is still on 7 out of 10. But, um... I think that's enough. Okay, I put about a cup of chicken stock in. And I'm going to let that come up to temperature and boil and thicken a little bit before I put the rest in because my pan is small. And I should have used a bigger pan because when I made this before, I used a pan with higher sides and it wasn't as close to the edge. So, if you haven't made this yet and you are going to make it, definitely don't do what I just did. Use a bigger pan. Alright, so um, just that quickly, the stock is starting to boil. And what I'm looking for is thickness. So the boiling right now is pretty um, liquidy. So the bubbling should be thicker and bigger bubbles. And that uh, that's indicative of the stock getting thick. But I don't have to tell you guys that. You guys know what thick, thick stock looks like. Um, and then the last step will be to add the kale and let it wilt. If you're using dinosaur kale, I would add it now, especially if you're not cutting the stems out. Um, but the, the curly kale that I have is going to cook a little faster than dinosaur kale does. I like dinosaur kale because it holds its, its own when you cook it. Whereas this kale that is often eaten raw is much softer. And um, it will cook faster. So. Okay. Mm. 
mushroom delicious all right so I tasted a little bit of mushroom and it tastes like mushroom no surprise but it does make me realize that this um, sauce is gonna need a little bit more salt and that's just because I've got um, I've got no salt added chicken stock So I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit of salt to this. And what I've added, so what I added to the chicken was about a quarter teaspoon. And what I added just now is about a quarter teaspoon. So I, all told, I've got half a teaspoon of salt in this whole um, pan, which is pretty much... Uh, enough for four people so that's only an eighth of a teaspoon of salt per person which is pretty good um, the American Heart Association recommends 1500 milligrams of salt maximum so if you get under that then that's good and that's about two-thirds of a teaspoon of salt per day so, um, two-thirds of a teaspoon of salt per day is the maximum. All right, I'm going to go ahead and add my kale. And let it start to wilt. Already turning bright green so this stuff cooks really fast all right so um, looks like we got a start of a question in the chat but uh, There's more. Ah, the Parmesan, yes. The Parmesan is seasoning. So Parmesan is a pretty salty cheese. So what I would recommend for the Parmesan is um, taste your sauce. If you haven't been adding salt like I have, taste your sauce and see if it still needs more salt. If it does, I suggest adding Parmesan because not only do you get salt, you get Parmesan flavor and it thickens it a little bit. So, I'm going to taste mine, see where I am with salt, and then I'm going to add Parmesan instead of salt this time. And But don't kid yourself into thinking that because you're adding Parmesan and not salt, that you're not adding salt. You are adding salt, because Parmesan is salty. So, just FYI, let me look at the back of this uh, cheese, see how much sodium it has. 250 milligrams of sodium per one inch cube. So I guess that's like, maybe half a tablespoon has 250 milligrams of sodium. And that is about one sixth, no, yes, one sixth of your daily maximum. So uh, keep that in mind. All right, so my kale is just about cooked. Let me taste what I have. I 
going to eat it as it is. Um, I'm going to add a little bit more though. And the reason why I'm going to add more Parmesan to this when it's already okay is because um, the spaghetti squash does not have any seasoning in it at all. So we need to over season the sauce just a little bit so that it can compensate for the spaghetti squash. If you're not going to eat this with spaghetti squash, then don't, um, don't over season the sauce. But you want the seasoning in the sauce to be pretty strong so that it, not like pretty strong, but like stronger than it needs to be. You get what I mean. So let me just grate. Probably, probably gonna grate about as much as a one inch cube in here. You can measure it if you want. And if you don't have a grater, you can just cut the Parmesan up into small pieces, like mince it, and put it in there and it will melt because this is hot enough and we're still cooking it. If you're going to just use it as a garnish as was suggested um i would i would use a grater but if you don't have a grater just put it in while it's still cooking and it will um it will incorporate and melt down okay and that's it a little, a little long in the tooth, this demo. Um, but uh, check your spaghetti squash, see if it's browning in the oven. The mushroom escaped. Okay, so to plate this up, I've got my spaghetti squash. I'm gonna get my sauce and vegetables and mushrooms and put that on top. And then we're ready to go. So I'm gonna turn this off. And change the camera view. Okay, so today we made spaghetti squash and um, mushroom sauce with chicken and kale. And it's a hypertension and diabetes friendly meal. The spaghetti squash does have carbohydrate in it. So watch your portion sizes on that and, um, and adjust your insulin if necessary. And uh, also, Click the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of the next live demo and we can cook together. I would love to see you in your kitchen, but I'm going to uh, eat this food now. So I'm going to sign off. Okay, bye.